Good morning. Welcome to the live stream for South Orlando Baptist Church. We're so glad that you've chosen to join with us today. We do have a Bible verse I want to open us with as we welcome you. It is Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray that God would accept the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart as we go into this hour. Father, thank you for this beautiful morning. We pray that you would bless our meditation. May we focus our hearts, our thoughts onto you. May you bless and give victory in our minds and in our hearts that we would be able to have from you incredible victory over negative thoughts, Father, over uh, thoughts of depression, uh, issues that we're battling. Father, give us victory today. and May we worship you today in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Father, that you give us that victory, that we're able to take every thought captive and make it obedient to the Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, come now. Bless this hour. May we commune with you as we sing and study your word. And may we be molded evermore into the image, your image. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. I do want to mention a few updates as we go forward in this service. Uh, one of them is the Renew campaign is ongoing. We, we are going to, this month will be our final month, October, that we make this a big push, and then we will put it into the background for a bit as we move forward. But our hope is we'll be able to replenish the, the flooring and the chairs of this room uh, very soon, hopefully before too long, and, and be able to see a renewal to this room. Our hearts are still knit together with those that cannot be with us in this room, and we're praying for healing of our land as we look at the COVID-19 pandemic that is still ongoing. We're, we've been praying for, of course, a vaccine and for different things to take place, and we definitely understand that many are un, they're just not ready to return. We still have different levels where you may be able to return. We do have the drive-in church every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we have the in service, 11 a.m. service here, where we have people that spread out and keep distance. And of course, we have online. We want you to feel comfortable doing what the Lord is leading you to do as you discern your own health needs and what you feel comfortable doing. But please pray for this church as we continue to move forward through these days and months. Now let me mention as well, uh, this month we will be pushing out another uh, baptism, a beach baptism for those that are able to come to that. And if you are watching this and you're thinking to yourself, I want to get baptized, well, we would love for you to join in on this wonderful day. We're looking at the Sunday evening, the second to the last Sunday of this month of October. And so as I'm looking at my calendar, that would be the 18th, uh, Sunday the 18th. That's just in a few weeks where we would like to go, even though the air may be cool, we want to go and we want to baptize publicly those that are ready for baptism. And if you need to do that, reach out to us. You can email me directly at david.crow at southorlandobaptist.org. If you're brand new with us, we'd love for you to fill out the connect form that's in the description box. Allow me to pray for us and we'll continue on in the service. Father, thank you for this time again. We pray you would bless the needs of this congregation, bless those that need a job and an income. Provide for your sheep, Father, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We pray for the needs of this congregation, the financial needs. Lord, we're looking at this need to renew this building and to renew the carpet and the seating. And I pray, God, you would move amongst the generosity of your saints, that we would be able to see this room have a refresh and be able to glorify you better together than we have been doing. Lord, bless us in our needs. And Father, we look forward to your unfolding providence. We thank you that you take care of us at every turn. You never leave us, you never forsake us. And out of your hand come just 
numerous blessings untold. Lord, bless us as we continue through these days. We ask it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It was many years ago when I made my decision after seminary to head into a church, a local church, to begin serving. I was able to serve as a senior pastor uh, of a country church and work there for nearly eight years just to see some growth happen. I had some friends, though, that were involved in church planting all over the nation. And one of my good friends, one of my closest friends, was involved in the Harvest Bible Chapel Network. It was a network of churches based from Chicago, and it was under the leadership of Pastor James McDonald. And so I had a, a close friend involved in planting churches within the Harvest Bible Church Network. What happened, though, sadly, over the last two years is Harvest Bible Network, the network has fallen apart. The, the senior pastor above it all has been removed from his pulpit there at Harvest Bible Chapel there in Chicago. And there is some ongoing litigation happening in the courts and sues and lawsuits and countersuits going on. And so much has been surfacing of what was happening behind the scenes. But it's a sad thing to see any sister church network fall apart through the leadership of a pastor. And so I don't know the full story. We're going to be watching that unfold sadly over the years to come as things come to fruition and come into focus. But I, I can remember, though, being warned in seminary that most of your church splits and problems that take place within a local church, they don't necessarily happen in the small groups. They don't happen in the Sunday school classes or in the home groups. Primarily, the vast majority of disasters, church splits, and yes, even false teachings originate from the pulpit and come from the pastor. And so it, it primarily, as I was being warned in seminary, begins with the pulpit and with the pastor. And as I heard that warning, I thought, man, there has to be a way to safeguard ourselves from being that problem or causing such a problem in the church. I'm thankful that God has provided clear instruction in his word, the Bible, as to how churches should operate and how pastors should operate. And there's much instruction we're going to be reading today from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, not only about pastors, but about really everyone within the church, pastors and congregants, members of a church. And today, if you have your copy of the Word of God, I want to discuss from God's Word this topic that comes out of 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5, and look together at an attitude of a healthy church. What does a healthy church look like? What kind of attitude is there in a healthy congregation? As you're turning there, I want to show the context. Peter is closing out now. His book, his final chapter, is right here before us. He's giving instruction on the behaviors that should exemplify Christians within the church. And as an elder, he begins to address fellow elders, fellow pastors, as to the behavior they should be exhibiting within the church. The, the, the phrase I would give, the attitude of all, the pastor and the congregation, is the phrase humble cooperation, humble cooperation. There should be a humility from the pastors and the humility of the church to cooperate together to seek the Lord's will. And so a healthy church will exhibit a lot of the behavior we're going to see in these verses. If you have your Bible open and ready to read, let me read from 1 Peter 5 verses 1 through 5. God's word says, therefore, as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of the Messiah and also a participant in the glory about to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but freely, according to God's will, not for the money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the same way, you younger men be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that your word instructs us in all manners of life, especially the life of the church. As we submit under its authority today, we ask you would bless all of us to play the role and to possess the attitude that your word commands of us, that we would have a humble cooperation with each other, and that we would honor you, because we know you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Bless us to follow the very example of Jesus. And may as we follow that example, may we outserve one another in good deeds as we move forward as a congregation. I pray this over us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here we are. 1 Peter 5, verse 1. He's closing out the suffering that comes from following Jesus in the last chapter. And then he says, therefore, in chapter 5, verse 1, we believe he may be speaking here about those who suffer 
according to doing God's will. Those who suffer according to God's will, that would be pastors who obey the calling of God to serve a congregation. And so he begins the verse, chapter 5, verse 1, with the word, therefore, as a fellow elder. Peter is, is showing us he was a pastor of a congregation. The Bible uses the word elder, shepherd, pastor, all of that, bishop, they're all synonymous, and they are used interchangeably as the same office, the office of the pastor. In Baptist churches, we call them pastors, but throughout history, they've had different names that come through in Scripture. He says, therefore, as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of the Messiah. Now, we don't believe Peter was there at the cross, but we do believe Peter saw uh, much that Jesus went through and suffered. If you remember the story of Peter, he was there in the garden when Jesus was praying and sweat drops were dropping like blood from Jesus. You also have, um, he was there when in the temple courts, Jesus was being beaten. Je uh, Jesus was there in witness of Peter that saw that take place and he denied Jesus three times. And so he was a fellow witness here to the sufferings of the Messiah. He's an eyewitness. This makes this letter a reading, and all of the New Testament is what we would call eyewitness testimony to Jesus. And so this is very important for us as historians and as Christians to understand a bit of what we're reading to see this is eyewitness testimony. He says, also a participant in the glory about to be revealed. Well, what on earth is he speaking of in that? He's, I believe he's referring very clearly here to what comes in the transfiguration that he saw in the transfiguration of Jesus. You remember John and Peter, James and John were the ones that went up the mountain and they got to see Jesus revealed uh, as he transfigured himself and his glory was revealed. So he just said, listen, I'm a fellow witness to the sufferings of the Messiah. I'm also a participant in the glory about to be revealed. I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you. The first thing today, an attitude of a healthy church. A healthy church will exhibit the following behavior. Number one, shepherds will, will uh, shepherd well the flock of God. It will shepherd well the flock of God. And this is addressed to the first point here today to shepherds. The following behavior, a shepherd will, will shepherd well the flock of God. So he says it right there in the verse, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing it out of compulsion, but freely according to God's will. He addresses three errors and three sins that pastors can fall into as they take on a church and pastor a church. And I know that when I was being ordained years ago, I had a, an older gentleman on my ordination council he said, David, you're about to head into ministry. I want you to be aware of the three G's. And I'm like, what are the three G's? And he's, because we all love to alliterate, right? We're pastors. He said, girls, greed, and glory. And he began to explain all of that. He said, you know, stay committed to your wife. Be content and, and don't try to, you know, just jump from church to church to get more money and also give all the glory to God. Don't seek your own glory. Peter uses two of the, the three G's here. He's got greed and glory in these verses. But he starts with a, another G that uh, is a very fascinating one for him to mention. He starts with grief here. He says, you know, don't oversee a, a flock or a church out of compulsion. And when I study the word compulsion, it just means you should not be accepting a church out of, out of an obligation. You shouldn't accept it out of dread or grief. But as the Lord would lead, uh, maybe as the Lord would call you to serve that church out of joy. And so you should never, if a pastor is watching this, you should never go and serve a church out of just com complete compulsion. Like, I've got to do it. No one else is going to do it. Let me do that. It should be an absolute delight and joy to go and serve a congregation because that's part of the calling of God on a pastor. You are called by God, and it's a joy as a servant of God to step into that calling and to step into whatever the Lord, you know, leads us to do. I do want to confess, though, it's been a delight. One of the greatest delights of my life has been serving South Orlando Baptist Church, a joy. And so I continue to find this a great joy and not a grief. He says also, uh, don't be greedy. Look at what he says here. Don't oversee a church out of compulsion, but freely, according to God's will, not for the money, but eagerly. And so he, he's addressing greed. A pastor should not take a church primarily just for the paycheck, or a pastor should not be jumping from church to church to just move up the ladder for financial gain. That's, that's greedy, and that would be just following the money, not following the Lord and following the will of God. But an eager, positive desire, fulfilling God's will, and a calling from God should be the primary motivator of a pastor. I want to be careful to say it's not that we should pay pastors poorly. We're told in Timothy that pastors, especially the ones that teach the word, are worthy of an income. But it should be not the intent. It shouldn't be the, the intent of the pastor to seek money 
as the primary focus of what drives him in ministry. I've always warned people, if you think uh, church is the place to go and to make a living, you know, it's, it's not the greatest way to make a living. There are other jobs you can do to make a living that, that'll, that would be far easier, I would say. And I know a lot of people think, oh, you pastors, you only work one hour on a Sunday morning. It's not true. W- we would invite you to do a ride along. Come and sit along and see what goes on in a week and see what we do. It's a busy job and it's, it's a heavy job for many and it's a humble calling. But don't be motivated by greed. And then uh, we see that though every year in the news, do we not, of pastors being exposed as being ones that, that are greedy. The, the gentleman I was mentioning at the beginning of the sermon, it's become common knowledge now that he was making a salary of over a million dollars a year to pastor his church. There is another pastor that's been in the news that his house is being known as a 16,000 square foot house with 7.5 bathrooms. And this is just public fodder for people to mock the kingdom and make fun of the kingdom. And these are stories of greed every year that I think make a diminishing view of the gospel from a unbelieving world that reads them. Every year, sadly, we have greedy stories of pastors trying to raise money for airplanes and different things for personal greed issues that are just making a mockery of the church. He finally speaks of glory in verse 3. says, not lording it over those entrusted to you. And so you have a lot happening in the word lording. You have this, this pride going on, this defiance, maybe this, this uh, overwhelming force of authority that's happening here. Pastors should avoid a posture of lording over the flock. Uh, maybe going through a power trip or, or going through something as a means of just pride The Greek emphasis, as I studied the word here, it means to rule with force, an iron fist, with excessive use of authority. But rather, he says, you should live as a humble example to the church. That's the mark of a good pastor. And so this is the attitude of of a godly pastor, according to Peter, as a fellow elder writing to the elders. Uh, He says, listen, don't be that way. Live as an example to the the flock, verse 3. Live as an example And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Friends, I'm looking as a shepherd of God's flock for that crown. And that's the one that I believe this passage leads me and all pastors to desire that crown towards. If we will deny ourselves, if we will give up a a hunt for glory and greed and, and serve the Lord out of a joy of his will, there will be that unfading crown available to all pastors. And so we see that here in, in this and I just know that it is sadly true that oftentimes pastors end up in this role and this role has a way of attracting narcissists and egomaniacs and all too often we are familiar with churches that fall apart through control issues or issues of a a pastor that was a control freak. I had a mentor mention to me years ago, David, never serve under any man who has no system of checks and balances. You want to serve in a place where you have people looking over you and asking how you're doing and where you're accountable to the congregation. And one thing I love about the Baptist church is in our business meetings, I have full accountability of this congregation, but I also have the deacons, I have other staff that are able to check on me and talk to me. But he said, don't go and serve under any man who has no authority or no one that he's accountable to. Another thing I think the scriptures help us with is we're able to observe any man of God as how he might treat his wife or his kids. What is his wife like? What are his kids like? Are they happy? Are they enjoying the Lord? Are they non-Christians? Because if he mistreats his family, he's going to mistreat the flock, and that's a good place to look when you are seeking a pastor. I want to ask this applicational question. Do you seek pastors in your life who perhaps are academic stars or business leaders with successful business backgrounds, or do you seek the humble examples, those that really are following the Lord Jesus? How do the ministers in your life handle these pitfalls As you've been observing these pitfalls in our culture, how well do you feel the ministers in your life are observing and and dealing with these pitfalls? And as our church, as we are seeking an associate pastor, let's be mindful of these verses as we keep that hunt open. These are some things we need to be aware of. So we see the attitude of the pastor. Let's now go to the attitude of the flock. And we get to that here in the next verse, verse 5. He says, In the same way, you younger men, be subject to the elders. Now, a couple of things to point out there. Let me give you the point. The attitude of healthy church, number two, is, is the, the flock will subject themselves to the elders. As the flock, subject yourselves to the elders. Subject yourselves to the elders. He's speaking here of, of young men 
uh, we believe for a number of reasons he's addressing the younger men. Most scholars believe it was the younger folks that would be the ones that might try to oppose the, the elder or the pastor. And so this is not speaking of older men when it says elders. In the context, it's speaking of that pastoral office. These are pastors. And so the young men, be subject. Submit yourselves unto those who are pastors. And so the word subject, it indicates a general willingness to support the elder's directions, except, of course, if an elder tries to lead you into sin or lead you astray. You never have to submit to such things. That's the rule. But Peter, again, he's not talking about older people. He's talking about pastors in the church. You have to know that this letter would be passed around from church to church. It'd be written in individual churches. I am one of those that, as I interpret the Greek and read it here in the English, 19 times in the New Testament, when the word elder is mentioned, it's mentioned in the plural. And you have, in Titus 1, Titus was to go and to establish in every church, singular, a plurality of elders. And so this is a question we get asked a lot. David, does South Orlando Baptist Church have a plurality of elders? And I say, yeah, we actually do. We have a plurality of elders. We have a number of pastors on staff who've been ordained by God, who are available to assist spiritually with the needs of this congregation. I'm not the only pastor here. Pastor Rick Steele is an associate pastor of worship. And when we have our associate pastor of students and education, they are going to be an ordained, seminary-trained pastor ready to minister. And, and as ordained men, we can marry, we can bury, but we can also minister to the soul, lead people to Christ, give input on matters of the gospel. Since I am not alone in that role in this church and others assist with that role, we have a plurality of elders in this church. And you see that in the New Testament patterns. You can see it in Acts when the Ephesian elders showed up, knowing they would see Paul no more, they began to weep. And it was one church, Ephesus, that had a plurality of elders. So I support and believe biblically that each church should have a multitude, a plurality of pastors assisting with the spiritual needs of its congregation. I have no issues with that. And so I just wanted to put that out there because it's here in this passage when he uses the word elders. Uh, he uses it in the plural in chapter 5, submit yourselves to the elders, subject yourselves to the elders. That's something that shows up here. But he's, he's really, I believe, addressing the whole church. It's Wayne Grudem and his commentary on this. He says, the question remains, why Peter spoke only to the men that are younger, not to the whole church, in, in commanding submission to the elders? It's probably because the younger people were generally those who would most need a reminder to be submissive to authority within the church. And so he says this would not imply that the others were free to rebel against the elders at all, but quite the opposite. If those who are likely to be most independent-minded and even at times rebellious against church leaders are commanded to be subject to the elders, then it follows that certainly everyone must be subject to the elders as well. And this gets us back to that imagery we have in marriage. We submit to each other, and, and I'm submitting to the Lord Jesus, and together we humbly cooperate. It's humble cooperation with each other. That's what I see happening right here. But I can remember years ago serving under a pastor where the pastor had already been let go. He was given some time. He was forced to resign, but given time to find his next place to serve. And so for about three months, we had an overlap where he was still the preaching pastor in the pulpit. And my wife and I were there serving him, serving the church. We began to see an incredible dishonor towards him from the flock that was unhealthy for that church. And it, it created a lasting wound on that church and on that family. And it's not the way things ought to go as we study a passage like this. That he was mistreated. And they were, even though they were giving him time, they were mistreating him in that way. I'll never forget when I became a senior pastor. I was a young guy. I was in my 20s. And as I was serving a church of, of mostly elder folks, I was very scared and internally to serve and to provide leadership to elders, to those who, older gentlemen, men that were the age of my grandfather. And I thought, what, what right do I have to say anything to give instruction to them? And honestly, I don't have anything in of myself to give, but I have the word of God. And that's the one thing we all agreed to. I was there to impart the word of God. And I'll never forget, there was one man, a, a deacon, that came to me and said, listen, you are my pastor. He was in his 80s. And very early in my tenure in that church, he looked at me and said, you're my pastor, and I'm behind you. And God has placed you in our church for a season. He's called you to serve here. I've discerned that calling in you. I'm going to support you, and I'm going to help you. And I'm praying for you every day. I'm not going to look down upon you because you're young, but I'm going to listen to what you are going to impart to me from the word of God, and you let me know if you need me for anything at all, and I'll be there for you. I can't tell you as a young man what that meant to me and how much that helped me to go home and to faithfully fulfill 
God's calling to serve and to stand in the pulpit and declare, thus says the Lord. I didn't go home with this feeling of, oh, great, I've got him in my pocket and I've, I've got some power. That wasn't it at all. I had someone that was looking to me to impart the word faithfully. And I knew he was dependent on the Lord, but depending on the word and depending on me to be uh, the, the pastor that would submit myself under the word and, and deliver that faithfully. And I'm thankful for the friendship he and I had for many years before he went home to be with the Lord. It meant so much. How supportive are you to the pastors? And not only to the pastors, but to the spiritual leaders in your life. How supportive are you? When you're in a Bible class and you're having someone that's prepared the word, breaking the word, and it is just nourishing your soul, how well do you encourage and speak out and just say, brother, thank you. This blessed me. Thank you so much. Um, do you think that they're they're, that you're a blessing to them, or do you think perhaps you might be a thorn to them w- with the way in which you've behaved? Well, let this passage give some instruction to you. And then the third thing, and this applies to all of us within the church. Third point today, the attitude of a healthy church is that it will suit up with humility. It will, it'll clothe itself and suit up with humility. If you'll excuse my alliteration, look at verse 5b, uh, verse 5 at the end. He says, all of you and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble suit up clothe up with humility clothe is a unique word that referred to an apron which a servant would put on before doing his tasks and and so many scholars believe and I believe exactly what Peter's doing he is recalling the time Jesus took the towel and washed the disciples feet and he wrapped the towel around himself tied it up and then he washed their feet and served them humbly as the maker of heavens and and earth, the maker of every disciple he was washing the feet of, he humbled himself and washed their feet. And so there are some that think that humility is elusive. Just when you think you are humble, you've lost it. That's the thought. But Jesus and Paul called themselves each humble in Scripture. In Matthew 11, 29 and Acts 20, 19, this was a quality they began to seek for. So let me define what humility means. This is something I'm to clothe myself with, you're to clothe yourself with. How do we do it? What does it look like? Andrew Murray gave a near-perfect definition of humility when he said this, humility is perfect quietness of heart. It is to expect nothing, to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me. And when I'm blamed or despised, I'm also at rest. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord where I can go in and shut the door and kneel to my Father in secret and I'm at peace as in a deep sea of calmness when all around me and above me is trouble. And so I think that's an interesting definition of humility. Let me give you a biblical definition that's, I think, pretty easy. The best biblical definition of humility is 2 Corinthians 3, 5. It says this, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Isn't that beautiful? Like, We're good for nothing. We can't do a darn thing to help anybody get better. Can't do it. We're inadequate. We're we're goobers. We're good for nothing. But what helps us to help others comes to us from God. Our adequacy comes completely from God. We're inadequate. God is completely adequate. Humility, this is the definition from that verse. Humility is being aware of your own insufficiency, but trusting in Christ's all sufficiency it's aware of your own inadequacy but but fully trusting in christ's full adequacy that's humility that is humility and i think that's good Uh, it's it's been said over the years that a branch that bears the most fruit for the kingdom is bent the lowest to the ground speaking of humility it's the one that's the lowest to christ the most bowed before the lord that bears the most fruit story is told of two brothers who grew up on a farm One went away to college and earned a law degree, became a partner in a prominent law firm in the the state capital. He was a big deal. The other brother stayed back and stayed on the family farm. And one day the lawyer came and visited his brother, the farmer, and he asked, hey, why don't you go out and make a name for yourself? Why don't you do something with your life? Why don't you go out and hold up your head high in the world like me? And the brother that was the farmer, he pointed And he said, you see that field of wheat over there? Look closely at it. It's only the empty heads that stand tall. Those are the ones that that are well filled that always bow low. And so he just said, I don't need to stand tall in this world. It's, I'm, I'm sufficient. I'm, 
I'm content with my lot in life. How well do you fight pride in your own heart? He quotes a proverb here, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. God is the maker of all things. If we have nothing in and of ourselves, everything we have is given to us from him, there is no room for boasting. There is nothing we can boast about other than God. That's it. Uh, So how well do you fight this? And I think the gospel of Jesus is the most humbling thing because there's not anything we can do in the gospel to earn a bit of our salvation. God accomplished it all through Jesus. There's no boasting or bragging in conversion. It's all of God. And so if I can speak to that matter for just a moment, you know this, that anyone who becomes a Christian has to humble himself, has to do this, to lower himself, to become truly converted. Jesus did not come to save the righteous ones, the prideful ones. He came to save the lowly sinners, the godly, the ungodly ones. And to do that, you have to admit that you're a sinner. That's a humbling thing to admit. I've made mistakes. I've done a lot of wrong stuff. You have to admit your need for Jesus Christ and what he did for you on that cross through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And you have to deny yourself. You can't in and of yourself save yourself. You can't in and of yourself contribute anything to your own salvation. But Christ accomplished it all on the cross. And you have to deny yourself completely and take up your cross and follow Jesus. And there is no pride at all in salvation for us because we cannot do anything to earn it. God does every bit of the saving. All we have to do is trust. The only thing we contribute at all into our own salvation is our sin when we repent of it. But other than that, we don't do anything to earn it. Christ earned it all. And there's no boasting we can possess on it. So humility is the first behavior of the genuine Christian. It's also the continuing behavior of the the Christian. And it is something we have to conclude, and as I conclude the message here, it is something that goes with us every day of our walk with Jesus Christ. Every day is a constant humbling of ourselves and a decreasing of ourself and an increasing of Christ in our life. It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he said this, we have plenty of people nowadays who could not kill a mouse without publishing it in the Gospel Gazette. Samson killed a lion and said nothing about it, and the Holy Spirit finds modesty so rare that he takes care to record it. Say much of what the Lord has done for you, but say little of what you have done for the Lord. Do not utter a single self-glorifying sentence. That was his warning to all of us in humility. So as I conclude just on his words, we are an insufficient church, an inadequate church. I am an insufficient pastor, an inadequate pastor. But may we together go to that only source of adequacy and sufficiency, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and men and women, may we seek the humility of John the Baptist. May our Lord increase, and may we ever decrease. To God be the glory. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you call us to a life of Christ. You call us to follow your Son. I pray that you would help us to have the same attitude in ourselves that was in him, who, although he possessed, he was God in the form of man, Lord, he denied himself and willingly went to the death of a cross and made himself a servant. Lord, may we outserve each other and may we humble ourselves before you and each other to serve and outdo each other in service. Bless us to do this and help us to have the right attitudes in our congregation in this church. Lord, as, as the pastor of this church, help me to continually look to you for the adequacy, for, for what's needed to lead this church. And may, as we work together, pastor and congregation, may we humbly cooperate with one another to fulfill your will in great joy. Bless us in what we need to do. And Father, I pray that you would excite us in in your providence as your plan unfolds. We would just see more and more joy and excitement as you save sinners. Bless us now, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're at the time of, of decision. If you need a decision to make, the Lord's drawing you to salvation, and you're ready to humble yourself and kneel before Christ as the King of kings, Lord of lords, and, and to trust on him as your Savior and repent of your sins. If that's your need today, why don't you, in your heart of hearts, as an act of your will, say, God, save me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And call out to God for salvation, and and he will save you. If you need to make that decision, let us know. We'd love to cooperate with you and to help you as a church. You can fill out the decision form that's in the description box of this video. If you need to do any other decisions, like join the church or get baptized, fill out that form and let us know how we can cooperate with you and what God's doing in your heart and in your life. As Rick Steele leads us in our closing hymn of commitment, let's do our business with the Lord through prayer, through song, or through filling out the forms as Rick Steele leads us right now.
Thank you so much for joining with us today. Thank you for the joy you bring in my heart every day when I get to wake up and serve you as your pastor. Bless. Uh, may you be blessed as we depart. May God bless us all to do his will and to love each other through the times we're in. Let's be mindful as we depart. Uh, this week, let's try to replenish our food pantry as more and more Orlando families have been drawing on that as a ministry of our church. We want to replenish that and, and serve well these families. Let me pray for us. Lord, bless as we depart, give grace to us, strength to us, and may we walk in full obedience. May we humble ourselves before you. And Father, may you fill us and use us for your kingdom and your glory and your pleasure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.